Marketplace Books and Traders Library are proud to present the Trade Secrets video series. When you're looking for new ways to boost your trading returns, these best-selling resources will give you the tactics, strategies, and ideas that will transform your trading. These books and courses give you the knowledge of highly respected educators like Jeff Greenblatt, author of Breakthrough Strategies for Predicting Any Market, Charting Elliott Wave, Lucas, Fibonacci, and Time for Profit. Oliver Velez, author of Strategies for Profiting on Every Trade and Five Tactics That Beat the Market. And Tony Turner, author of A Beginner's Guide to Short Selling. All of the courses in our Trade Secrets video series are supported with an educational online manual. With this manual, you can observe the charts up close. And with our website, you can access this valuable resource at any time. Just log in at traderslibrary.com forward slash trade secrets. Traders Library and Marketplace Books also feature a myriad of interactive multimedia courses in our Traders Education Corner. These course books come complete with the text, interactive test questions, online video presentations, glossaries, and downloadable charts. Make sure you visit TradersLibrary.com forward slash TLEC to learn more. To make sure you get the best price on these profit-boosting DVDs and all of your other trading resources, go to TradersLibrary.com and sign up for our Rewards Weekly program. here this morning. Um, my topic today is accurately predicting price targets and exit points. So to begin with, I want to tell you a little bit about my trading style so that you understand where I'm coming from throughout this entire presentation. I don't really focus on using a lot of indicators or scanners or anything like that in my trading. I focus primarily upon price development I will use volume as a confirmation tool, but other than that, I'm primarily just reading price action. So throughout this presentation, everything that I'm covering is going to apply to any market you trade, whether you trade Forex, options, futures, just stocks, it doesn't matter, and it also doesn't matter what time frame you trade on. So you might be a scalper, you might be a position trader, meaning you're holding for several weeks to several months on end. It doesn't really matter. Everything I cover is still going to apply. If you have any questions on any of the material covered, I will take a break at the end of the session and I'll leave time for questions. So just kind of hold on to them then because you might have them answered throughout the course of the presentation. So to begin with, here's our disclaimers. Now obviously the ultimate goal of all traders is to make money. And now while risk management is essential, meaning you're not going to be a profitable trader unless you know how to cut your losses, you know how to keep your risk pretty even throughout the course of each and every trade you're taking, unless you can accurately predict <coughs> decent exit points, you're still going to struggle. How many of you here have gotten into a, a number of trades where in the end, it ended up it would have been profitable if you just held on to it. Never came to your stop, but you got out anyway and ended up making significantly less than you would have. <laughs> Everyone? This was a primary problem of mine when I first started trading. It was probably my most significant problem. I didn't have too much of a difficulty in terms of the analytical part. I was always picking the great positions, the right positions to be in, but I just could not hold on to them. So I needed to develop some sort of system where I was able to build confidence in what I was doing. And what we're going to see throughout the course of this presentation is basically how to build that confidence through using the types of tools that I do. Now there's a number of rewards to being able to accurately produce, uh, accurately predict target levels as well as exit points. Of course, the first and foremost is to boost your confidence. If you don't have confidence in a position, this is where most of us are bailing too early. We're getting out of a position well before it's even had a chance to hit what we thought might be a target level. So if you have a system in place before you even enter a position, you're going to be much more likely to 
have the confidence to hold to those target levels. And I'll also talk about a couple of techniques for getting to that point as you're building confidence as you're going along. You'll also learn the ability to time pi price pivots. So you'll learn the ability to time price pivots. And what price pivots are, are those actual highs and lows in the market. A lot of people say, well, you know, don't short a high, don't buy a low. There's actual price patterns that you do want to get in building positions off of highs and lows. And as we go through this presentation, I'm going to show you some of the tricks to identify when a high or a low is coming. So if you are in a position already, for instance, let's say you're long something, you can start to see when things are going to begin to shift and you'll see that reversal forming. You can also learn to help avoid being that high or low tick. If you're like me, you've had a number of times where you've had a stop in place and you've gotten taken out. Just literally, it'll be like the last tick, the low tick, or it'll be the high tick and you were short. And you'll just get thrown out right away very quickly, only to see it turn around and reverse. And I'm going to show you some of the things that you can help identify when that's most likely to happen and some tricks to help avoid that happening as often. You're always going to have it happen every once in a while, but let's just try to cut it down as much as possible. We're also going to look at cutting your losses with certainty. So not only in terms of just predicting price targets, but this goes along with the exit points. Are you setting your stops correctly? This is going to help avoid getting out too early or getting out at the wrong price levels or even giving back too much of your gain to begin with. This goes, this, uh, in terms of giving back too much gain to begin with, this deals with moving your stops but maximizing your potential. So, in other words, accurately setting correct trailing price levels. And ultimately, the goal is going to be to fatten your wallet or your trading account, as the case might be. Now, as I said when I began this presentation, I didn't really know where I was coming from when I got into the market. I didn't know how to place targets. I didn't know how to place exits. When I came into trading, it was kind of back when online trading was first beginning. There wasn't a lot out there for technical analysis. Fundamental analysis was the main thing everybody was focusing on. Things like uh, can slim and other methods like that for longer term holds and investments. This was back in the mid 90s, so we, a lot of the online trading stuff was just starting up then. And technical analysis was sort of viewed as a, a fringe science or a fringe way of analyzing the market. I came from a background in anthropology though and art. So for me, I was always drawn to patterns and patterns of behavior. And this was something that when it came to the market, charting offered a way of viewing how people act and emotional impact of what they're feeling actually displayed on a chart. So it was like a snapshot or a visual picture of what was really going on in the mind of the traders or investors that were taking part in the market. So for me, this was something that was really easy for me to catch on to, but I kind of had to learn it on my own. So I, I kind of threw out all of the books people were hoisting upon me on, well, you have to learn this indicator or you have to learn this method because it was really confusing for me. I had no idea what anything was in the market. I didn't even know what the Dow was, other than it took up time on my local news at night. But I, you know, I got into this as sort of, it was a puzzle and I wanted to figure it out. I wanted to learn how can I do this myself. I'd, I'd had a lot of friends that had trouble with the people that they'd invested money in and they were losing money, even though it was the 90s. And you know, everybody's supposed to make money in the 90s, right? Right? No? <laughs> well, no, obviously everybody didn't, but I wanted to learn how I could kind of um, take control of my own life and my own investment future. Now, when we look at how to time targets and, and taking exit points, the main things that this is going to allow you to do is once you learn how to recognize different building blocks in price development, which is what we're going to get into next, it's going to allow you to be prepared for the unexpected by learning to anticipate it, meaning when you get into a position, it's not necessarily going to go exactly how you expect it to go. 
There might be some shift in momentum, news comes out, something like that. I'm going to show you some of the methods of how to recognize when the shift is taking place, when you have to tighten up your targets, as well as when you need to widen them and allow them for more room that you're going to be able to hit higher target levels. It's also going to enhance your ability to think calmly and rationally as the trade unfolds, overriding your emotional responses which may cloud your judgment. Usually when you take an exit early, a lot of times we go back and we say, why did we do that? You know, I had this target in mind, but I bailed on it anyway. I knew it was going to get there. Why did I get out of this position? Well, if you can explain in writing, in words, why something is most likely to hit a certain level, it's going to be easier for you to hold that level rather than if you say, well, intuition tells me it's going to get to 115 or whatever. But you might not have any reason that you can explain why you think it's going to go to that point. So we're going to look at how to explain why certain price levels will hit and why they will hold. Basically, the course of this presentation is going to cover these topics the predicting the price targets, managing open positions, profit taking techniques, adjusting stops, and trailing stops. In order to accurately predict future price action in a security, you have to have a firm understanding of current market dynamics at play. And what this means is that in terms of every pattern or price development in the market, there's certain things going on within that pattern. A lot of the books even today on technical analysis, they don't show you at all what this is. They teach you, well, this is a head and shoulders pattern. You know, it goes up, has a higher high, has a lower high, goes back down. It doesn't tell you how to actually analyze what's going on within that head and shoulders pattern itself. In fact, if you, if you uh, attended Jeff Greenblatt's presentation yesterday or talked to him, for instance, you'll know that he doesn't trade the head and shoulders pattern per se either. A lot of people, when you're looking at trading a head and shoulders pattern, you're looking at a headline break. That's what they tell you to do. A headline break is basically you're attaching the high from the first peak to the low on the pullback off the high and taking that break as your entry trigger. Unfortunately, this is usually a little bit late in the game. Prices have already started to pick up. There's a lot of momentum already coming in. So you're getting a little bit, you're getting a little bit um, late into the position. When it comes to actually analyzing price action, there's five main things that I look at. The first one is pace, support and resistance, volume, trends placement, and correction periods. Notice that each and every one of these things is a relatively simple concept at, at, the, um, at the basic idea here. You've all heard of things like support and resistance and volume, I'm assuming. But how many of you know the details of getting into how to actually read those levels well, knowing the ins and outs of how to approach support and resistance levels? There's a lot of things to look for when it comes to these five building blocks. And I'm going to detail each and, one, each and every one of them in terms of uh, taking price targets as well as the exit points. The first tool that I use in analyzing price action is PACE. Um, this is a concept, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's similar to momentum, but I'm not using any momentum oscillator or anything like that in terms of how to measure it. Pace is basically a measurement of the momentum of a trend move as a secure, in a security as compared to not only the average move, but also the most recent move on any given time frame. What this means is that I'm looking at how fast or slow is the price changing in a particular security at this time compared to how fast or slow it changed in the past. And I'm doing this just visually looking at the chart, looking at the current action and comparing it to previous price action. Here's a basic template that I've used in a lot of presentations. And what you're going to see here in a moment is that even how this particular template unfolds takes place 
today in a lot of securities. So we're going to see this same unfolding of this momentum shift, this momentum change in securities that I put together just for this particular presentation, even though I've had this template for a number of years. Basically, the idea behind understanding pace is that when you have a larger than average move, or a very strong upside rapid move, the main idea is that often that is going to correct through a more gradual correction. So for instance, if we are looking at timing, let's say a reversal pattern off of highs, if you have something that shoots sharply higher like this, it's going to have a more difficult time turning over and gaining momentum as quickly. So if you're looking for target levels on a reversal off of a high like that, you might have to go for something that is a closer price point than you might ideally look for otherwise. If you have something, however, where the momentum is more gradual on the downside as compared to the average move of previous price action, you can get a more rapid, more substantial follow through when that shift actually breaks. So when this pullback or this base breaks higher, it's going to give you a larger target that you can look for. As this pace begins to shift, let's say you have a stronger pullback than a previous one, then the chances increase that a bounce off of a support level is also going to start to slow. So you would see a more gradual rally which would necessitate a closer target than you might otherwise look for if you had a more solid sideways base or a more gradual pullback. As you can see here, there's a very slightly higher high in this pattern. This is a pattern that I just call a 2T. Some of you might be familiar with the term 2B. Um, it's just a slightly lower low, slightly higher high. I like to use the term 2T, think of in terms of uh, two tops. And what this does is it's a trap type of pattern. So it's trapping people that are getting in above this previous high. It usually takes place when a trend is more exhausted. We're going to look at this here again in a little bit more detail in a couple more minutes. And when this shift takes place on the downside, if you have something that bounces back up very quickly, even though it has had a sharper downside move, that's an indication that you're more likely to see a triangle or a sideways trend or some sort of range or congestion begin to form. Usually when you have a sharp drop and it bounces back sharply as well, you can look for a target that is just under where that previous drop took place. So the target level on something that reverses quickly like this is often going to be just below that previous target or that previous high. Even if this begins to turn around and starts to pick up a little bit later on, a lot of times you're going to see at least some congestion or some sort of base or rest before, as in that prior high zone before it's able to break higher and continue the move in that direction. As the range progresses, when you start to see momentum shift again, for instance, in this case, it's favoring the lower end of the range. That's a really good indication that a breakdown is coming. A lot of times when you're looking at patterns like a head and shoulders pattern or something like that, let's say you're looking at that right shoulder. Well, instead of looking at the trend or the, uh, the headline or the, head, the, the line connecting the, uh, the two lows here, go and look for this change or shift in momentum within that shoulder itself. It's going to give you a heads up in terms of the entry timing on that position. So you can actually use a shift or a break of this shift in momentum here to enter the position on the short side. When it comes to using pace and understanding pace and momentum for target timing, we're going to look at a couple very specific techniques with this here in a little bit how to use this momentum to get to the correct target levels. It'll give you an indication of whether it can hit those higher levels or hit those lower levels. Here's a good example. I have the template here below. Notice we have very similar shifts in momentum. We have this sharp upside move, slower congestive downside move here, then the sharper upside move, and notice how the momentum shifts again up here at the highs. It's not an immediate turnover. It's not an immediate reversal or uh, a pivot going directly back. If this had pivoted and started to pull a lower, directly lower, 
again, this low or this congestion zone in here would be what we would be looking for as a target zone because we had this previous pivot here and we would have that sharper pullback again, which would then more likely lead to a longer correction or congestion. We do have a congestion form a little bit later on here and it's very similar to what happened down here in the template where we have these moves back and forth. You can see that it went right back up into the middle of this congestion from these highs here. It didn't quite get as high as it could have. It could have gotten a little bit higher, but we have this congestion here and when we look at support and resistance levels in a moment, I'm going to show you how to use congestion itself as a target level. Um, a little bit of a preview is usually when you're looking at congestion, oftentimes the middle of that congestion zone will hold better than either of the extremes of the congestion when you're looking for an exact target. So that's usually where I will place a target. Again, I'll show you that here in a minute though. Notice the momentum shift here at the end. And this helps lead to the stronger breakdown. And here's support back here at this previous congestion. Um, going into the next slide, we'll actually look at, uh, at these previous slides here in a couple minutes. I want to show you how to look at the targets on those. But you can see that this is the same concepts but in reverse. Here's again kind of the uh, strong breakdown, the strong pivot, and notice how it came right back up into this congestion from where it broke down, but that serves as, re as resistance, it serves as a target point for this type of particular move. You even have that rapid reversal once again as it heads back lower. Notice it doesn't hit this exact low. A lot of times people will aim for that previous low as a target, but usually it will stall just before it. When we talk about support and resistance levels, you'll start to understand this a little bit better. As the momentum shifts, that allows for a stronger breakout or a stronger move out of this. Because we have no substantial momentum shift within this triangle up until the 30th of September, it has a very difficult time breaking through any of the previous highs or previous lows. But when that momentum shifts finally on the morning of the 30th, that allows for that shift to increase substantially and for the momentum to really pick up. And that's represented here with J on the chart. So you can see that slower move or slower pullback. When I'm looking at pace and how to read pace, there's a lot of people that will make a common mistake of attaching like a previous high to the low of a move. And they'll say that that's the momentum or that's the pace of the move. Really what you want to do is if you're going to draw on your chart, which I recommend highly to begin with to really get a feel for what the pace of a move is, try to transect as many of the bars as possible within the move itself. Now what that means is try to put your line or your bar through the middle of as many of these candlesticks as possible to give you a more accurate reading of what the pace of the momentum is. This means you're not connecting the highs, you're not connecting the lows, you're just looking at the bulk of the channel of the move. But you're not drawing trend channels per se, because if you were drawing trend, trend channels per se, you would be looking at connecting like the highs to highs and lows to lows, and we're not doing that. One thing you can do is if you do want to connect highs to highs and lows to lows on a trend channel, you can do that and then draw a line right through the middle of that channel and that's also going to show you what that momentum is. Um, I want you to pay very close attention to this concept of pace though because it's, it's one of the most important things that you can look at when you are trying to time moves in the market and it's also one of the things that very few people ever talk about or ever even think about when they're looking at moves. Here's one more example of this. Again, we have this triangle type of action. Pointer not working here, okay. So we have another sharp upside move, another sharp reversal. This stalls a little bit here before it gets to this previous low zone here, but it's also the middle of this correction here. And when we look at support and resistance, again, you will see that. There's a momentum shift over here, and this is where I was talking about transecting the move. This is actually a smaller triangle within the larger triangle, but compared to this pullback or pull upside here, 
This pullback and correction marked J is actually more gradual on the downside and it's holding this upper area or upper level of this previous move marked I on the chart. So you have a slower correction or a slower pullback following a faster momentum move on the upside, which is also within a larger faster momentum move on the upside and a larger triangle that's taking place on the upside. So this is a pattern that heading into the end of the summer I took as a breakout right here from this move in this channel. And by a by identifying these pace shifts within a larger range, you can get higher accuracy setups and triggers that aren't necessarily going to have an any higher chance of hitting a stop that you might use as a traditional stop. For instance, a lot of people, you're taking traditional breakouts, you're taking the absolute high of the breakout of a channel. So you'd be taking a breakout, for instance, above 2006 highs. You wouldn't be looking in to get looking to get into the position until then, and you'd probably be placing a stop under 2006, 2007 lows. Well, if you look at that, that's a huge move. I mean, that's almost 20 points in and of itself, and the stock's only 40 points. So it doesn't really make sense to take that type of a setup in this particular position. But if you can use momentum and pace as a concept, you can look for those smaller triggers, such as this smaller triangle within this larger one, so when you're getting into a position, you can use these smaller moves within the larger move to help time that, that actual entry point. The next thing that we're going to look at are the support and resistance levels. Support and resistance are basically price zones in the market where security is liable to react in some manner that affects the trend which is in play as these support and resistance levels hit. There's a couple of things that can happen when a support or resistance level hits. It can either reverse a price move, meaning it will actually turn it around. You will get those pivot points, those rapid reversals. It could halt a price move, meaning it can stall it or it could lead to a congestion, otherwise just preventing it from it being able to break it immediately, but then it might break it a little bit later on. And it could also trigger a price move. This will happen a lot if you use indicators such as moving averages. You'll see like a price pull back into a 20 period moving average. And you'll see that that acts as sort of a catalyst to get the prices moving again. So this is another thing that it could do. When you're looking at support and resistance, it's very important to identify what the support and resistance levels are before you even get into a position. When it comes to identifying stop levels as well as target levels, you want to know what levels might serve as roadblocks in your position, what levels might stall your move, and they can also be used as guides for establishing price targets. So you can look at the support and resistance levels and say, well, there's not really a lot that stands in the way of this price, this price action until these certain levels hit. You're going to have to combine each of the five tools, each of the five building blocks to get to a accurate assessment of what a target level is because not everything that you might identify as a support or resistance level is going to hold very well. Some of them, in fact, will hold very, you know, relatively um, lightly. So for instance, if we go back to the chart of this trading range, a lot of times on breakouts, you'll notice that when the price did finally break here on J, it went through this previous high very quickly. And it went another, let's see, is that about two, two points without really stopping at all. So a previous high, which is one type of resistance level, is not necessarily going to always hold that well. There's a couple of core types of support and resistance levels to look at. Some of you are familiar with the most basic like whole number support and resistance. And for instance, Dow 10K, you know, I had to pull out my Dow 10K hat again here last couple of weeks. Um, thought that was in the closet for a while, but you know, we have levels like that where they serve as memory markers in people's minds. So 
When you get to things like 10K or 9K or even 8K, as we've seen here recently, these are levels that people think of. And so when it comes back into these price levels in the future, people remember, well, it held that zone before, so I'm going to kind of get out of a lot of my position then, or I'm going to be more leery establishing a new position as it's coming into those zones. So obviously, these are levels to always keep an eye out for. When it comes to the breakouts of channel and pace, though, if you have a slower paced move on a pullback, let's say it's coming off of a price resistance level like, um, let's say a stock traded like $99.75. Well, you would think that 100 would be a substantial price resistance level. But if this stock, for instance, trades a couple of dollars an average in a range per day, that $100 level, if there's congestion under it at $99.75, when that channel breaks from that $99.75, if it's congesting along those highs, it might go through that 100 pretty quickly and not really stall there at all. Maybe it stalls for a couple seconds, but it breaks through it without having to form another correction or anything like that. So this is where pace or momentum starts to come into play with these support and resistance levels. The next thing we look at are prior highs or lows, areas of congestion, indicators, and equal or measured moves. And I'm going to go through each of these one at a time so that you have a good, firm understanding of what they stand for and what they mean. The first one that we're going to look at are the actual previous highs and lows and whole number support and resistance levels. We're also going to look at this in terms of pace. Because when you see pace or momentum go very quickly into a support or resistance level, it has more push or more give to it. When you think in terms of support and resistance, think in terms of zones and not actual prices, exact prices. For, so for instance, $20 here, that's a price resistance zone. And you can get a little bit of a push through that $20, particularly if the momentum or the pace of a move is stronger. So when we're looking at establishing targets, you want to look at how fast is my security moving once it's triggered my setup. I might have an ideal target in mind to begin with, but I might need to adjust that target level based upon how quickly it's approaching what I expected to be the, the main target. The faster it can go into it, the more quickly I'm going to adjust my target and give it a little bit more room and try to get a little bit more out of it, squeeze a little bit more out of it. Usually when I'm looking at taking a target at a support or resistance level, I'm actually placing my exit before that support or resistance level hits. So for instance, let's just say $20. We're looking at $20 as a price resistance level here on SNDK. Well, typically ahead of time, if that's what I identified as my target level, I will have an order on the books, usually a limit order, just under $20. Usually it's $19.97 or $0.96, cents, thereabouts because then I'm getting out as that move is heading into the resistance and I have a firm understanding that it's likely to stall there or at least reverse their stall for a little bit and I'm not trying to fight with everybody that they think well oh it's trading twenty dollars and five cents that means twenty dollars is broken and really it hasn't it's just trapping people that are assuming $20 is broken, and then it falls and immediately plummets back to, well, let's see what did it do here. Fell back to about $19.30 almost immediately after it hit 20. And if you're trying to chase that on the way down, well, you're giving up a ton of your gain when, okay, you might have missed out on a couple of cents on the upside by placing your target into that $20 to begin with. Of course, Whole numbers, again, are not the only thing that we're looking at in terms of placing targets. You might have looked at this, for instance, and seen, well, you have a gap here on the second, and you also have a moving average here. This is a 200 period simple moving average. I very rarely use indicators, but when I do, the two that I will use most often are 20 and 200 simple period moving average. I use these most often on an intraday and a daily basis on a 5-minute, a 15-minute, 30-minute, 60-minute chart, 
and the daily and the weekly chart. So I will use them on all of those charts, but a lot of times intraday, I don't necessarily have them up. You'll see that a lot of times, even these moving averages, once you start to get a feel for the market, you can see the pace of the momentum actually slowing into certain levels if you're kind of watching them, micromanaging them. These are things that over time you're going to get a better feel for. But if you're struggling with how to place these targets and exit points to begin with, it does help to have a couple of indicators on there. When you're thinking in terms of indicators, though, be very careful not to overload your charts. I see so many people that they'll pull up a chart and you can barely even see the candlesticks because they have so many indicators stacked up at the bottom of their charts. And I know there's probably a lot of people that are teaching classes right now that are showing you a lot of indicators. But I, I don't use them. Um, there, it, there is one other indicator that does work very well if you trade futures in particular, especially if you trade them in today, and that's Fibonacci levels. So for those of you that are interested in looking at some indicators and you want to have that, ex that extra confirmation or that extra tool to look at, I would suggest learning a little bit of the basics about Fibonacci. Um, I don't go into a lot of like the, the higher advanced forms of it. There's people that they do things with Fibonacci series I've never even would have fathomed considering doing. But if you just look at the basic levels, you're going to um, find that they hold very well in the futures themselves. And they're just another type of price support or resistance. Um, with any type of price support or resistance, of course, the first time it hits, it's going to be the most likely for it to hold and react, but it also can have the most give to it. So when you're looking at a resistance level like 20, for instance, the first time that hits, it might be able to push through it to $20.15, $20.20, and pop right back, and still hold that and lead to a longer congestion right along 20. And a little bit later on, it might not hit it exactly. So if you're trading a trading range and you saw that a previous high was $20.20, well, you might still want to take a target if you're looking for a bounce off of a low of a range, for instance. You might still want to place your target under that $20 still at the $19.97.96 because there's less of a chance that it's going to hit as high as it did that first time. You can see a number of types of this price support and resistance here where the previous highs will serve as support even once they break. So this $20 level here served as support again on the third. You can see the stronger move into it. It stalls the move, leads to a little bit of a triangle here before it pulls down into the moving average. And it can also serve as resistance even once it breaks through it and comes back up. So you have a previous high here around $20.50 and it stalls it again over here on E. So B and E again are similar resistance levels and they would also be what I would consider to be whole number resistance because even though people think of whole numbers as $20, $21, $22, when you get into these smaller stocks, people think of the 50 cent levels just as they would a whole number. So $20.50, $21.50, those are going to stall moves just as easily as a whole number would. The other type are the congestion and indicator moving averages and other types of uh, support and resistance levels. Um, built upon indicators. So we have a congestion zone, for instance, with this triangle. When you're looking at congestion zones, again, like I mentioned earlier, often the middle of that congestion zone is a really good level of where you can place a target on a pullback. Um, this is where people run into trouble when they are placing trailing stops or adjusting their stops. They'll take a breakout from a trading range, for instance, and maybe it only breaks by a small amount. Let's say a trading range is 50 cents and it breaks out by 25 cents. Well, they start to see it stall around 25 cents after the breakout. So this is where they might bail too early, fearing that, well, it's only moved 25 cents and it looks like it's going to pull back and I don't want to take a stop. So they bail on it or they'll let it pull back and they'll say, well, I'm just going to move my stop to break even. So that way, you know, I already have 25 cent gain. At least I'm not giving it all back or I'm giving it all back but I'm not taking a loss. 
and so they'll move their stops to break even. Problem with this is, is that when you're taking a breakout from a trading channel or a trading range, you're taking a breakout from a resistance level. So when that resistance level breaks, it becomes support on the way back. And if it pulls back into that support level, that level is a zone and it might not hold it exactly. If you're taking a breakout, let's say above 20, your entry might be $20.07. You move it to break even. Even if you move it down to $19.97, you're still right at that zone of support. When we uh, progress a little bit further in this presentation, I'm going to show you moves of how to actually move these stops correctly so that you're not getting taken out on these breaks into these congestion zones. But basically, the idea to keep in mind is that you want to be very careful moving your stops quickly to begin with and keep those wider stops even though you might fear that you're going to get stopped out. This is where a trading journal really comes into play. One of the things I'm working with uh, on Traders Library right now is putting together a book on how to actually keep an accurate trading journal because a lot of people don't really do it correctly. They'll keep spreadsheets and say, oh, well, this is where I got into my position, this is where I got out of my position. That doesn't help you out very much when you're going back and trying to analyze what you did. When you want to build confidence in your positions and confidence in the things that I'm talking about and show that they actually work, you're going to want to see them over time on charts that you're actually trading. One of the things that I like to work with clients on when they're entering a position, write down what they think the target level is even as they get into the position. So even though they might have an idea in mind, actually writing it down helps them hold to that target level more often than it would if they just kept it mentally. Another thing that you can do in working towards trying to keep things for those larger targets is there's a concept of taking partials on a position. Now as you get more advanced as a trader you're not going to want to use this technique as often but to begin with it can help build confidence getting into those higher target levels. For instance you can learn how to read what these support and resistance levels are and you can start to take off some of your position as it comes into what you know is going to be an initial zone where your position might stall. But you hold on to the rest of your position looking for what you've identified as a larger target. The main concept that I think a lot of you are going to really appreciate in this presentation is the concept of an equal or a measured move. This is the main one that I use in terms of targeting targets, targeting targets on a breakout or a pullback such as a bull flag or even things like the head and shoulders pattern where you're targeting um, the breakdown from that shoulder. In that case you'd be looking at the initial move off of the high of the head and then comparing the breakdown out of that shoulder to that initial move as a first target level. This concept brings in pace and momentum in that when you are looking at any sort of congestion or trading range, if you look at the move that preceded that range, shown here in blue with this green arrow, if you take the breakout from that congestion, usually I use the end of that range here, and project that higher, that's going to give you a target level. And the only thing that is going to change whether this target level hits or not is going to be pace and trend placement. We'll look at trend placement here in a little bit, but as long as you are fairly early or middle on in a trend, as long as the pace on this breakout remains comparable to what this initial move is, this target level is going to hit with very high accuracy. A lot of times within just a couple of cents you can predict that absolute high or low on that breakout. And it's really quite amazing. In this example, however, notice that while the pace began to pick up and surged immediately, it stalled about halfway at this $20.50 price resistance. And this fell into this um, cup with handle type of pattern here. And by adding that handle to it, even though the breakout of the handle was also a similar momentum move, in terms of this initial momentum move, the entire pace of this breakout has now shifted.
So this means you've got to look for a tighter target than you would have looked for to begin with. And in terms of that tighter target, you can now use that initial breakout move and then the continuation of that move out of the handle on that larger cup with handle pattern. So this now gives you a target going right into what would be that, that $21 level. It's actually a little bit higher. It was about $21.10 thereabouts. The momentum did pick up a little bit towards the end. That helped push it higher. But you can see that overall, compared to this move, you've gotten pretty close to what that high is when you're looking at the larger picture, assuming you had taken this initial trigger here. So you've gotten really, really good risk to reward on this type of breakout using that targeting technique as well as dropping down to the smaller time frames and looking at the momentum shifting in the smaller time frame. You've got a little bit of a slower pullback here and a break of that channel. You can keep a stop under the lows of that channel there. Here's a, a stock I took uh, back in September in RIMM. This is a trade that I took. And it's basically a type of triangle breakout. I used the pace, um, the momentum shift within the triangle itself to time my entry on this. You can see that we had this sharper downside move into the open. This was also following a gap move. And it fell into this trading range. And notice that we had this slower upside move right here into 1130 that's much more gradual than how this initial move began. And it's also more gradual than this downside move here. This is, I'll just call this a typical two-wave continuation pattern. I've seen other names attached to it, but I like to think of it as that because you're looking at two counter waves within the move and then that triggers a continuation move. Here we have a larger trend move in place where it did take place in a larger gap and so this is a substantially longer drop than we've seen so far just intraday and so in the grand scale of things this correction itself is really quite minor compared to that larger time frame and so as this breaks lower it's not able to gain as, mom as much momentum as it did going into the day to begin with so Projecting this target of an equal move doesn't work quite as well because of the larger extension on this. If you're looking at breakouts or breakdowns, a lot of times it helps to go up to a larger time frame such as like, uh, this is a three minute chart, so go up to a 15 minute chart for instance. And if you've seen something where in the first 15 minutes of the day, whether it's the stock or the indices themselves, if it has moved an average day's range within that first 15 minutes of the day already, it's going to have a very difficult time gaining any real momentum into uh, the rest of the morning. It's usually going to take at least until the afternoon, and it usually is not going to pick up as extreme as it was initially to begin with. Yes, sir? Um, the top of that second move down, why did you pick that peak that you did versus the previous higher peak? Okay, very good question. His question is, why did I take this as the short setup, right, as opposed to this one here? And the reason is that I'm actually looking for those two waves specifically. This is a particular pattern that I look for. And that once it has had the two waves of corrective action, it's more likely to give a solid break of that previous low than it would just taking it off of the initial reversal. Off the initial reversal, it has a higher risk that it's going to stall just above that previous low. And sometimes I'll take those as a scalp, or if this is a daily chart, then I'd be more willing to take it because it would have had plenty of room that it could still have gone to hit that previous low. But because it is an intraday time frame and it is the smaller time frame, you want to get in where it's going to have the highest chance of breaking through the support levels and proceeding to a larger target, even if that target has to be adjusted because of where it's taking place in the larger trend. When, it, when you're looking at, as I was saying, when you're looking at these, uh, these trend moves, these bases, they're occurring intraday in the beginning. Um, if you can 
draw it back and look at a 15 minute time frame. If you see something that has formed that average range within the first 15 minutes of the day, usually if you get a breakdown of that morning move and it breaks that same morning, it's going to happen similar to this, meaning it's not going to have that same momentum increase. You're going to have this more gradual break or breakdown, and that can help you get a feel for what that target level might be. In that case, I usually look for just under a previous low as an initial target level because you're more likely to have the risk of getting that 2B action where it's the slightly lower low that traps it and it can reverse it. And you can look at, of course, the whole numbers and support levels like that. In this particular one, RIMM, I had an initial target of 71. What I did to help time this target was I looked at this move here, this first drop coming ahead of the breakdown of the range, and projected an equal move based upon that. Just like I did in the previous one, up here where we can see we stepped back and looked at the smaller action. So because of the trend placement and this larger drop here, I looked at this as the first initial target zone. On this particular day, I, um, I had to take off early. I wasn't trading in the afternoon. Um, I run a chat room and so I gave them a larger target of 70 and that was based upon where the initial target support hit going into 1300, you can again take that level there and project the breakdown of that. Again, I use that last pivot usually within the range itself to help identify a breakdown. There's, there's more complex ways of doing it, but that's going to be the easiest one for you to, memor to remember. And um, I will take that high going into that low. If it's a pivot high into a pivot low, if it's congestion, I'll usually take that last little congestion high and project that downwards. So the equal move itself was about 69, 69, 70 thereabouts. But with 70 being a whole number support level as well, kind of combined the two to get that as my initial or my larger target on the position. When you're looking at applying support and resistance levels, the larger the time frame, the stronger the support or resistance level will be, but the more give the zone will have. So for instance, when we are looking at like the Dow right now and how this has fallen, we have come into a support zone, but because we're looking at this move on a monthly time frame, it's now a substantial drop on a monthly time frame, this zone that it's trading in is actually quite wide and there's a lot of give to it. When you're looking intraday, there will be less give. And the faster the momentum or the faster the pace, the more give the support or resistance zone will have. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to both of those two things when you're looking at the support and resistance and timing the targets. When you have multiple types of support and resistance coming together at the same time, that's also going to strengthen that zone. So if you have price support, like a whole number, coming together with a moving average support, with a previous high or previous congestion zone, that's going to add more strength to those support and resistance levels, and they're going to make for better targets and better levels to place a stop under than if it's just a single type of support or resistance. This is where when it comes to indicators, they can be helpful. You want to be careful not to add too many that you become confused or that you're relying totally on an indicator as a reason for getting into and out of a position, but it can serve as that added confirmation as long as you're just looking at it as just one more tool to add. Now the closer support or resistance level is, the more likely it's going to break than one that's going to hit after a larger move. So when you have momentum breaking out of a trading range, this is where I said earlier that it can break those closer support and resistance levels much more easily than if it has to sustain a larger momentum move. So when you're looking at the, um, this break here higher, for instance, it's able to bust through this closer previous high here very easily because it's a rather close support or close resistance level. 
The 20 here is a close resistance, 20, 20, or sorry, 2050 is a closer resistance level, but as it comes and moves higher and moves further, it's going to have a harder time getting through those higher levels of resistance. You can see that it didn't quite even make it to uh, 2150, it stalled right under that, but that 21 zone, it had a difficult time really pushing through that to sustain the type of move that we saw over here. It wasn't able to get to what that higher target level would have been, closer to 22. Earlier I said that the first time a supporter resistance level hits is when it's going to be the strongest. The one that I like to use most often when I'm taking a setup for a break of a supporter resistance level, let's say a channel or even that triangle in the morning, that two wave pattern that the man asked about at the back of the room, um, I like to take that third test of support or resistance. I find that that's the one that's most likely to break unless you have a longer sustained choppier trading range, then you might have a little bit um, a little bit more test of support or resistance, but oftentimes that third one has a really good chance of breaking. So when I'm looking at the previous pattern, for instance, here, this breakdown was that third test of support or resistance. You can see that it stalled it, but notice that it didn't really stall it for long. Even though it stalled here a little bit for like 15 minutes, it was still able to break that zone on that same test or that same congestion of that previous low. Whereas if it comes and tests it for just the second time, especially if it's done so after like a V type of pattern or a mountain type of pattern, it's going to be more likely to hold that previous high or previous low. Now the stronger the move is into the support or resistance, the more give it's going to have the first time that support or resistance level hits. And I mentioned this earlier as well. And so if I'm looking at an equal move target, for instance, if that target level is like uh, $20, if the momentum or the pace of the move is very, very strong into that $20 level, you can get away with at times putting your target or taking half of your position off at like 1997 and then holding the rest of it for like 2005 or 2007 and being able to push to get that little bit of extra room from it and still not have increased your risk really. You still want to get out at that resistance zone, especially if you have that coming into play with an equal move level. But you can have it hold and uh, give you a little bit more room on that. Going to have to pick up the speed here a little bit. The next thing I look at is volume. So volume is just a measure of the number of shares or contracts that exchange hands in a given time period. And it's instrumental in representing the level of emotional commitment of market participants. There's a couple of things we look at in timing targets and exits on volume. The first is that increases in volume can serve as confirmation, meaning confirmation on a breakout, or they can serve as exhaustion. And this is where it comes in terms of timing targets. Decreases in volume can also indicate, conge indicate congestion, meaning that they'll often take place as the trading range is forming. And they indicate a lack of interest. So if you have a setup that has triggered a breakout, for instance, but you don't have volume coming in to confirm it, you're either too early and are going to have to sit on it a little bit longer, or there's just not the interest to sustain a move and you're going to have to tighten up your stops and tighten up your strategy a lot better. When we're looking at analyzing volume, what we're looking at here in terms of B is that volume is decreasing on this downside move. So if you were looking at a reversal off that high and you had taken this as a pivot because the momentum had shifted where you had a strong momentum move into the open, and then it shifted here. You might have taken a channel break as a reversal pattern, but since the volume is actually dropping on this pullback, it suggests that that move is going to hold a closer support level and be able to reverse more quickly off of it than it will be to break it immediately. It helped when it pulled back higher at C, formed that 2T, that double top, but it did so without any volume increase. It did not increase in volume to confirm that stronger momentum move on the upside. This allowed for it to break down very quickly. On this breakdown, 
this might have been one of the days that we had um, some of the news going on. But on this breakdown, notice that even though we had a volume spike here at D, that does not indicate the absolute low of the move. When a reversal is real and true and you have a, a momentum coming in very strongly off of a reversal and you have volume picking up very, very strongly, on this first move lower, a lot of times that's going to indicate the beginning of a larger trend. So you can have those chances for lower lows as that trend progresses. It does, however, give you an indication that you are seeing some exhaustion come in, and that's where you got a little bit of a stall right here. You can see that one upside bar in between just after that D pattern, but it's not the absolute low of the move. And as it goes again into this previous, into this uh, new low here at E, once again notice the volume increasing, volume spiking. This is another momentum move, a momentum exhaustion move. And I would consider that to be an exhaustion bar, as well as this would be called an exhaustion bar, because you have that larger volume, and it gives you a heads up to start to watch for a shift or a change in pace to help give you an idea of where an initial support level is. In this case, at D, we have price support from the gap closure here. In E, there's not that same level. We have um, some whole number support, but you probably have to look a little bit farther back to see other support levels. Trends are the next thing that we look at, and they form in a number of ways. Where, that, where a setup takes place in a larger trend is going to be a good indication of how much target potential that particular setup has. So for instance, most of you are familiar with the concept of Elliott wave, um, three wave, trend development, that type of thing. The basic concept is you have an initial move higher and two corrective moves, followed by a second move and two corrective moves, and a third move and two corrective moves. When you are looking at uh, a trend development such as this, one of the things you want to keep in mind is that in order for this three-wave trend development to really hold true, look at how long it takes for a position or for a correction to take place between each of those upside waves of momentum. So for instance, this first correction following this initial move, measure how long that takes. Does it take 30 minutes? Does it take 30 days? If the next correction is also very similar to what that previous one is, that's when you can tell that that third move is probably going to be the last move before you see a break in this trend channel. If there is a difference in terms of that time frame between each of those moves, then it's not going to be as helpful for saying, well, this is necessarily the end of the trend. This is where people get trapped with trend days where they think, well, after three initial waves higher intraday that that trend's going to reverse or turn around and they start shorting things. But the trend just keeps going and keeps moving higher. Typically, what is, has happened during that day is that each of the corrections is a different length of time. So this helps sustain that trend longer on the upside. Following the third move, you can get a bounce where it attempts a fourth move. It might even make a higher high. What you cannot get very easily, or hardly ever at all, is an equal move compared to that third move. So if you are buying a support level off of a third pullback, you're going to have to adjust what your target levels are because you cannot use an equal move of this third wave to get that next target on a fourth wave if this correction here is also similar to this. Let's say it's 30 days. So you have another 30 day pullback after it's had three waves. It's not going to be able to break that previous high well. If it does, it's going to be that 2T pattern where it traps it and leads to a larger reversal. It can base out longer and continue the trend, but it's not going to get there initially. Here's an example of that RGLD we were looking at earlier. We were looking at this trading range here, trading channel here. You can see it had an initial move higher back into 2003, two waves of pullback. The second wave or pullback was slower than the first, and this kind of helped 
change and shift the momentum over a little bit going into 2006. Two-wave pullback in 2006, 2007. When the momentum on each of these pullbacks is similar, you can get that third move or a third base within that next correction. So if the first pullback, for instance, the pace of that move, similar to it in the second move, then you can get a third pullback or base or congestion move before that correction is able to break. Again, measure the time of the move, how long it took to develop as well. And you can see that from the time this started to pull back before when it started to increase momentum again and break out of this triangle, that's about the same amount of time it took coming into this here as well. So this is a, a trade, again, I, I gave it in my position trader a few months back in, uh, in earlier this September. Of course, the market has shifted a little bit. We'll see how much it congestion plays around in here. But this is the basic concept that that pattern was built on. Another position I've had recently is in the uh, yen, the Japanese yen. And we have the same type of thing here where we have the three waves of downside. What you can see here, though, is there's also a momentum shift in that we have this first leg of downside, which had a little bit of a congestion in the middle of it. But this wave of congestion and this wave of congestion are similar in terms of how long they took to form, whereas this one is much shorter. So that means that this becomes part of a larger move or a larger leg. And then we have a momentum shift here compared to this initial drop. And this is one of my favorite patterns to trade. And it gave a buy trigger as this channel broke down here. If you look at the USD um, JPY, it's a smoother chart than this. This is the FXY, which is just the uh, currency shares, for those of you that, sh that trade the stocks instead of the uh, Forex. We have this V pattern here. And as you might recall earlier from the pay section, that's what placed that as an initial resistance zone right here into that previous high. And you can see the congestion from that has stalled into that level, leading to a little bit of a base and it wasn't able to immediately break through that price level because it had that, that initial V here. Here's the move you can also see on a line chart where it has two waves of correction within each of these bounces as well. The next thing that we look at are correction periods. These are times of the day or times of the year that the market is most likely to reverse a trend, start a new trend, or fall into a trading range or congestion. Intraday, when you're looking at correction periods, the main ones <coughs> fall at 15 minutes and 45 minutes past the hour in the morning. And then going into the afternoon, they start to shift at 11 o'clock. So you see 11 o'clock, 11.15, and then it kind of bounces up to 12 o'clock. So when you're looking at targets and exit points, if you pay attention to these particular times of the day, these are when you're going to see these prices reverse. You're going to see reversals. You're going to see breakouts. You're going to see things fall into trading ranges. So maybe it hits a resistance level going into 1400 in the afternoon. And then it falls into a trading range there. When you combine this correction period concept with these other building blocks of development, you can see where they start to come into play and start to work together to build a larger concept of how to place these targets and to identify whether you're getting out at the right place or not. Because if you have a correction period taking place both at the time you're entering a position as well as when you're exiting a position, the higher the chances are that you're actually getting out of it at the right time, where even if it doesn't reverse, it's going to stall there, fall into some sort of congestion or range. You can see examples here with the 12.45 reversal here in the morning on Apple along with the 11.15 one and then the 11 o'clock one. And also you have a shift here in the momentum at this high where even though it had a strong momentum move on the upside, the momentum began to turn over here. So if you had drawn or transected this move, you would see it move up about like that and then take a turn and it looks like a little bit somebody doing a little bit of an Egyptian pose. And that indicates that a reversal is going to come or it's going to lead to a longer congestion type of move. Typically, this type of reversal is going to lead to at least two waves of downside 
And depending on the momentum of those two waves, if they're sharp, they can fall all the way back to this previous low very easily. If it's slower and has a little bit more congestion or is in a larger trend, then it can have a harder time getting past that. And it will hold an initial support level at the previous congestion zones. When you're keeping, when you're looking at targets, always remember to keep the bigger picture in mind. This is where a lot of traders run into problems. They start to micromanage. This is where I had a lot of difficulty and occasionally still slip up a lot to this day where I do a lot of trading on different time frames. So I'm scalping sometimes, sometimes I'm holding for a few hours, and sometimes I'm holding things for a few weeks or even a few months. If I drop down to smaller time frames while I'm in the middle of a position and it's not even close to a target level, I'm more likely to look at the support and resistance levels on those smaller time frames and say, oh, I know it's going to stall there. I've got to get out or I've got to take part of my position off. If you drop back and don't keep that smaller time frame up once you're in the position and only use that larger time frame that you might have built the position on in the first place, you are less likely to get out of that position too early. So if you find like a breakout or a bull flag or something like that on a 15 minute time frame, your equal move should be built initially upon that 15 minute time frame unless you have those shifts in momentum on the breakout like we saw with a couple of examples here. But once you have that take place, you don't want to drop down to like a two minute or a five minute and and try to pay attention and follow it on that because you're more likely to bail too early. The next thing we're going to look at here is adjusting stops and using trailing stop methodologies. And like I said, the number one problem of many traders when it comes to adjusting stops is that they do so too quickly. And this is a, a big problem I had to begin with also is that when I was in a position, I didn't want to take a loss, especially if I'd already taken two or three stops in a row to begin with. Then the next position, I want to keep it a lot tighter. So even if I've only had like, maybe I had a stop initially of 50 cents and I only have 40 cents of gain, I'll take that 40 cents of gain, even though it doesn't even cover one of my previous stops, just because I want to have that gain. And so even to protect that, letting it start to run a little farther, I was really aggressive in adjusting the stops. I would aggre I aggressively adjust them under things like a, a 20 period simple moving average or, or things like that and move them up very, very quickly. But you don't want to move your stops quickly to begin with. When I first get into a position, I'm using the pivot points as my stop levels. And I will not use another method until the second pivot level has been put in place if I have that higher target. Let's say up here is my equal move target, okay? Well, if we have an initial range or breakout or something here, my stop is down here under that last pivot low within the range, but you can see it pulled up. It didn't even cover what my stop would have been on the initial move higher. You would have definitely gotten stopped out if you moved to a break-even stop. But there's also the great tendency to, after an initial pullback, after it's pulled back once here, people will move a stop very quickly. What happens is that, remember how corrections often take two waves to form? So they might be placing a stop under that first wave of that correction where it pulls back it bounces a little bit and then it has a more gradual pullback but it takes out this previous low and then goes so this is where you can get stopped out just before you see that strong momentum surge take place this is especially common if you're really early on getting in on a pattern getting in on a bull flag getting on a breakout of any channel or anything like that and you can get like a little bit longer of a congestion or a little bit of a, a slow start to begin with so make sure you have those two waves at least wait for that and as it breaks to the to a new high that's where you can go and start to adjust your stop so if you only see one wave of pullback don't adjust it under that low until it breaks to a new high if you have the two waves and the second wave is more gradual than the first wave then you can adjust it under that second low 
even before it's broken to a new high. But otherwise, don't do it because you're most likely to, to run a higher risk of getting just flushed out before it goes. Here's an example of this type of stop adjustment. This is a short that I took on the ES. And again, it's that trading range type of thing here. And I took it before this breakdown occurred, I took it as this uh, channel here broke. A lot of times with that two wave correction, like I said, an initial entry might be as this second bounce takes place, but it didn't last quite as long as I was looking for. I was looking for it to last about as long as that first initial bounce. So it fell a little bit short of that. Um, if you have the difference between the two lows being similar on a two wave bounce, you're going to have a higher potential of making sure that you're not in it too early or you're not in it as a trap and it's more likely to actually break on that third low. So I got in it as it was actually um, congesting or pulling back again here and I did not move the stop until it broke this previous um, low here. So that's when I moved it to number two. And the same thing could be, could be done as well when it breaks to this third low and puts in a little pivot here, or the second low rather, puts in a little pivot, and then you can um, move the stop to above that second bounce as this previous pivot here breaks into this third low. With trend placement and trend moves and things like that though, usually once the trend starts to become exhausted or extended like that, you want to start to use tighter trailing stop methodologies. The next one to go to as a position progresses is watch for the momentum shifts. If you have a breakout, for instance, that's gone very strongly and it doesn't quite still get to your target level, if you add like a 20 period simple moving average, this is one of my favorites for this type of thing. You can also see it if you're just using um, candlestick charts or bar charts where if you start to get a lot of overlap from one bar to the next as it's moving higher, adjust your stop under that and if that channel starts to break, you can use that as a secondary trailing stop method and be very close to getting that, that closer target level yet knowing that if that breaks, it's probably going to be a faster breakdown. This is particularly um, true, you can see, well here's an example here first in the ES. You can see the three waves. Notice that our third stop would have been adjusted above this high here, okay? And it probably would not have been taken out here, but we had this moving average coming into place and here it falls into and it starts hugging this moving average. Well, if you draw a line along that channel or that congestion along the moving average, when that breaks, that gives you a secondary way to adjust your stop as you're coming closer to target levels. In this case, you can see the range is very wide, so it's not the most ideal in this particular instance, but as I was putting together this presentation, this was the example that happened that day. So uh, you can see it's a little bit tighter, breaks it higher right here, and it's just one way to help tighten it up. A lot of times it'll be even lower, it'll be down in here. The third method is very similar and that's just keeping a break of a channel. So if you have a lot of overlap, it's coming into a third wave higher, a third move, when that channel breaks, you go ahead and take that channel as your exit trigger, even if your stop hasn't or your target hasn't necessarily hit. And here's that example here on the smaller time frame of the ES. So you can see the third drop and notice that that third move lower is also an equal move. Well, that covers it for today. I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions, please come feel free to ask. I also have a course put together that goes over the five technical tools in more detail, so if you're interested in that as well, I have some available here. Thank you guys.